Well, a lot going on this week. A lot going on here with the things that we have uh, just for our life together here uh, in our life groups and on the different events we're hosting this week on Tuesday and Thursday. A lot going on in our country. And uh, here's my prayer and my hope for our time together that uh, as we leave here today, as we go back out from here into the places where we live and the places we work and the, the places we go to school and our relationships, our families, our friendships, that we would go with a sense of peace and clarity, moving into a very uh, anxious world, that we would go with peace and clarity about exactly who we are called to be, what our God is doing in the world, the fact that his kingdom is unshaken and that we are to go out with, with a sense of purpose um, that is, that is uh, deeper than our American citizenship, something that is, that is rooted in our identity as followers of Jesus. So um, today we're actually, we're in our final week in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And, um, and then we're also in the final chapter. During midweek, we're in the final chapter of the, the book we've been using as a discussion guide for our life groups, which is called Beautiful Resistance by John Tyson. And uh, in this series, we've been looking every week at various aspects of what it means to be uh, a people who are not just reflecting the culture back to the culture. We're not just an echo of the culture, but we're actually an alternative and, and a, a Christ-like, specifically a Christ-like alternative in our, in our world. And so that means that we want to be permeated and saturated by, by two things, the nature of our Savior and Lord, and also his purposes, his mission in the world, his purposes and his mission. So... Um, this week we come to the final uh, aspect of, of this, this kind of paradox we've been looking at. And this one's called Celebration Must Resist Cynicism. Celebration Must Resist Cynicism. And um, that one's not as obvious as some of the other titles. Some, as you thumb through the book, some of the chapters were a, a little more like, oh yeah, that's kind of on the nose. Love must resist hate. Like that one doesn't catch us off guard, right? Like, oh yes, let's, let's lean into that. But I think this one, even though it's, it's not as obvious, I think it's incredibly time, timely and helpful. Uh, we did not, when we planned this teaching schedule, we didn't plan for this chapter to arrive on the Sunday before the American election. Uh, we actually started this series based on when in September it would make the most sense to start it and, and have room for people to find groups. And then we launched and then it brings us to this Sunday of celebration must resist cynicism. So here's how our author, Tyson, describes this aspect of being a Christ-like alternative in our world. He says, I know it may seem like an interesting juxtaposition, celebration and cynicism. Why not joy resisting cynicism or, or hope resisting cynicism? But celebration is explicit. It's defiant. Not only does it recognize who God is and what he's doing, but it also calls for a response. I love this line. Celebration is godly defiance in a culture of doubt. I love that line. Celebration is godly defiance in a culture of doubt. I think he could have also wrote a culture of fear, a culture of suspicion, a culture of accusation, a culture of slander. Here's the thing. We talk about celebration. We're talking specifically about, about Christian celebration. And this Christian celebration is rooted in a deeper narrative than the one that, than whatever's playing out in the latest news cycle, right? Seems like the news cycle is always, there's always something going on and it's almost always bad news and it's always produces anxiety and anxiousness and fear and hatred and, and it, that, well, and that's what it does really, really well. Christian celebration is rooted in a deeper narrative than that. It's rooted in deliberately fixing our minds and our hearts, again, on who God is and what God is doing. And not only what he is doing, but what he has promised to finish. The reason that Christians can celebrate, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the news cycle, is because of what God is doing and what he has promised to complete. So that means 
that while we navigate the realities as real people living in a real world, we can also live with our hearts planted in the world that is to come. I mean, we can live up there while we're living down here. So as we, as we turn to Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus one last time, I just want to remind you, especially if you're new, here's the overall structure of the letter of Ephesians. It's been broken into chapters to make it easier to find our place. But originally, it was just one letter. But Paul spent the first half of the letter on one thing, and then he transitioned to, to a, a, a different emphasis than the remainder. The first three chapters were about theology and beliefs. Specifically, he was talking to people who had become followers of Jesus, and he was sharing with them the reality, the theological reality of what happened when they surrendered their lives to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit came in, and they were born again. So here's who, and, and the language that he uses over and over in this book is this little phrase, in Christ. Now that you're in Christ, this is what's true about you. Now that you're in Christ, here's who you are. Now that you're in Christ, here's what's different about who you once were. Right? Essentially, he says they've been adopted into a new family. And that if you're in Christ, your purpose is to carry God's image in this world. To further his purposes in the world. So that's the first three chapters. The remaining three chapters, he gets into application or behaviors. He, first three is about beliefs. The next three is about behaviors. So essentially, since you believe this, here's what that translates into behaviors. Here's how you should then live, right? The remaining chapters, he's focused on applying how, they, how their identity translates into new creations, how it change, translates into changed behaviors. I would phrase it as it's new ways of being in a broken world. That's what the last four, two, three chapters are about. So that's the part we're going to be in today. We're going to be in that last three chapters. We're going to be picking up in chapter five, verse one. It starts off like this. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Okay. That's, the, that's the, the big picture. That's kind of like the banner over this whole section that he's going to be in is you are now adopted into God's family. Your identity is no longer as citizens of an earthly kingdom. Your primary identity is now citizens, your children of a loving heavenly father. And that plays out in how you live. You are to imitate him the way that he loved, the way that he loves, right? I, I noticed this this week. I, every now and then we talk about gospel nutshells. Gospel nutshells are like little uh, tightly packed, condensed uh, paragraphs of scripture that contain the whole gospel in one succinct place. And I had never caught this, but this, these two verses right here, that's the whole gospel, and I'm not going to take time to unpack it right now. I did in my notes, and it's just not. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave a little bit of, I'll say there's good grazing there for you, right? I would, I would invite you to memorize those two verses and to chew on them. And you could spend the rest of your Christian life chewing on those verses and finding application and, and direction for your life. It's incredibly powerful. We're going to go on from there. But this, this is the metaphor that he uses. He talks about walking in love. He's talking about, again, how your beliefs translate to your behaviors. And when he, when he says walking in love, what he's talking about is an intentional, directional, conscious choice to live a certain way. He's going to use that metaphor again in, just a, in, a, in a few verses down in just a moment. But he's talking about the way that we walk. And he says, you are to walk in love. This is the way that you now live in your new identity as those who are in Christ. So verse 15, he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. I want to look first at that little timestamp there. He says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Now, Paul wasn't writing to 21st century Americans. 
if he, if he was, we could say, well, I wonder what he means by the days are evil. And we could probably, you know, start to, we could start a bullet list that and we could spend the rest of the morning talking about what around us says that the days are evil. But he's not. He's writing in, in first century Rome. And so maybe specifically he's, he's looking at, you know, the Greco-Roman Empire with Nero as the current, pre- not president, Caesar. And the Roman Empire, of course, we know by reputation, was characterized by debauchery, violence, slavery, immorality, injustice. Even like, at this moment, as Paul's writing this, he's in prison. He's in Roman prison, right? So maybe that's what he's looking around. Maybe that's his, his current experience of days that are evil. But I think Paul's talking about something broader than that. And it's having to do with the, the, the timeline of all creation, when he says days are evil, that's the same word he uses in another one of his letters. In Galatians 1, he says that Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. He's saying that there's, there's a timeline. So this is the whole theological, you know, eschatology of Paul and the early church. But basically, they, they realize that we live in what's called the church age and it's in between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus. Now, the early church, Paul in the first century, they didn't know how long that gap was going to be until the second coming. But they realized that until Jesus came back, there was going to be this age of tension in which both the, the kingdom of God had broken in in a new way. Remember, Jesus walked around and he announced the kingdom of God is near, believe the good news. And then he showed people that the kingdom of God had broken in. Right? Right? So the kingdom of God had broken in a significant way, but the presence of evil, or the reality of living in a fallen world was very much still present here too. And so it's this age of tension. And, and in between these two, Paul's saying there's an urgency because we don't know when it comes to an end. We look forward to when it comes to an end because that's when all things will be made new. That's when there is no more sin or death or weeping or crying or disease or hatred or all the things. It's like, we look forward to that, but until then, God's wish, God's desire is that no one would perish. That no one who doesn't know him would not come to know him. Would not come to surrender their lives to him and receive the forgiveness and new life that he offers. And so when he says making the best use of the time because the days are evil, he's not just talking about his circumstance of being a prisoner in Rome. He's saying there's an urgency to all of creation. And we live in this time. And if anybody's going to announce and continue the mission of Jesus, it's his children. He's entrusted it to us, right? The witness of the entire New Testament, in fact, not just Paul's letter, but the witness of the entire New Testament is that this knowledge that Jesus is coming back and we live in this this time in between creates an urgency for God's people. That in every generation, and so of course, the the first generation of disciples, they lived with an urgency. They they expected Jesus to be coming back in their lifetime. It didn't happen. And yet they still lived with urgency. And every generation of the church in every time and place is, is invited to and asked to live with that same sense of urgency and purposefulness so that we're walking in an intentional way in our world, right? Also in this verse 515, he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. This translation, this is ESV, it reads, be careful then how you walk. Some other translations trying to help people uh, understand the bigger picture, what he's talking about, will say, be careful then how you live. How you live your moment-to-moment life in your circumstances, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, with your friendships and your family, be careful. The idea is, is to not thoughtlessly just be swept along with the tide of culture. The whole world out there that's just rushing, doing its thing. 
And he says, don't just get thoughtlessly swept up in that. Live intentionally. Deliberately, consciously choosing your steps. Choosing reactions and responses that are a witness to our Lord and Savior. A witness to who our God is. So Paul lays out two contrasting paths right here. He says, therefore... There's this path that, are, these are contrasting. He says there's a path of, of people who are, are walking in ways that are foolish and unwise. There's a path that's wise. And there's a path that is uh, being f- drunk with wine. There's a path of being filled with the Spirit. And he says, you, you get to choose. You are, you are empowered to choose. The implication is we have a stewardship of our lives. And we have the free will to choose which path we'll walk. So what Paul does here is that, that last line, do not be drunk with wine, but for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. He's going to unpack what he means specifically by being filled with the Spirit with four specific examples of the Spirit-filled life. That's what we're going to look at today is four examples. So he says... Um, so we'll start off with that verse again, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And I put a colon there because in the Greek, everything that follows is a, four different expressions of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. So be filled with the Spirit. For example, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Greek scholars would tell us that the verb structure there is a present imperative, indicating this is an ongoing filling. So you might say, be being filled. Okay. So this is different. This is, this is in addition to an initial encounter with the Holy Spirit. We know that when someone surrenders their life to God and they're born again of the Spirit, is the language that Jesus used in John. When you're born again of the Spirit, there's, that's, that's the, the first encounter with God's presence. There's, there's a, a baptism of the Spirit that sometimes happens right then. Sometimes it's a subsequent event, but a, a, an infilling and, a, and an empowering of the Holy Spirit. This is, this, is, this is something beyond those. It's an ongoing, be being filled. Think of it like an interior fountain of the Holy Spirit that bubbles up from our hearts into the world around us and becomes the daily pattern of how we live. Be being filled. So Paul says, don't keep getting drunk. Do keep getting filled. Right? trade. Make the trade. This means that being filled with the Spirit, when Paul talks about right here, when he's talking to Christians about the life that is going to carry Jesus' name, it's not limited to the charismatic expression of the gifts of the Spirit. We affirm those. In fact, this week we had a a teaching team planning meeting for the next calendar year. And one of the things that we're anticipating is doing a series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But understand this, those are, sometimes those are the most obvious. We talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit and the thing that we often go to in charismatic circles are the more supernatural aspects of, uh, of speaking in tongues or, or uh, being used to, to, to bring healing to people, miracles and the supernatural, right? Those are the things that we tend to think of. Equally important is the things that Paul's saying right here an ongoing and active source of new life. So he gives four specifics. It's interesting that that two of them are about our life together. Two of them happen in the context of of a community that's navigating this world together and carrying Jesus' name together. Meaning that this idea about being filled with the Spirit is not just about me being filled with the Spirit or you being filled with the Spirit. What he's talking about in Ephesians is us being filled with the Spirit. We be being filled. I know that's not good grammar. (laughs) But you get it, right? We be being filled. We're going to look at four expressions. Number one, be filled, be being filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Let's talk about those three categories. Psalms, uh, those are the prayers of David and other psalmists as well. Find them in 
book of Psalms, kind of in the middle of your Bible. You'll notice that oftentimes they, the, these, were, these were prayers of David, but they were put to music. David was a musician. And so oftentimes you'll see titles like uh, To the Choir Master, A Psalm of David, or To the Choir Master, or uh, A Masco of David. Sometimes it gives a, uh, what looks like it's a tune, like To the Tune of Mary Had a Little Lamb, something like that, right? Like it literally will give, give cues like that for whoever's leading a corporate worship gathering. So psalms are, are the prayers of David in the early church. Um, there's uh, hymns is the second category there. It's a little less certain because we don't have a category of, of hymns that are like a, a book of the Bible that are the hymns. But um, these are probably uh, excerpts from the prophets and other places where the church has, is taking what is their scripture, the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, and they're putting music to them, which music makes things more memorable and therefore more portable, right? And so like last week, Pastor Brent took us through Philippians chapter two, and he noticed that there's this, this place where it's indented and it's like this little poem and it's set aside. It's it, the, the writers of our, of our Bibles, they try to show us when something is a, is, is a poem or a hymn. And most likely this was a hymn of the early church. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have this mindset. Who in very, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God to be something to use to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, but took on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness, being found in, human, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The early church sang that. I don't know what tune they sang it to, and I won't try and do that. That wouldn't be helpful <laughs> to you. <laughs> but they sang songs because songs stick with you, right? You can leave here today, and whatever the last song that we sing is, you'll probably be humming it throughout the day. You may not remember a word I said, but you'll go singing the song, won't you? The third category, he said, is singing spiritual songs. This one's, uh, it could be, it's not, he doesn't unpack that, say what it is. It could be contemporary songs that they were writing. They were just like us. They were musicians and they wrote songs. Could be spontaneous songs. You know, sometimes you'll be in a worship service and a spontaneous song will arise out of that moment. In fact, uh, a couple months ago, maybe, Pastor Jesse introduced a new song that had just been recorded and said, hey, by the way, the origins of this song were that it came out of a spontaneous moment of worship in our, in our weekday worship and prayer times. And it was such a powerful, you know, lyric that we, we took it and turned it into a song. So Paul says, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Here, this is an expression of the spirit-filled life. But did you notice that he said, sing them to one another? What's striking is that he doesn't say, focus on singing these to God. He will in a minute, so he's not leaving that out. But he starts by saying, sing these to one another. Because one of the ways we grow in our knowledge of God and being shaped in his image is the songs that we sing when we gather together. I shared with 101 a story this week. Uh, we were in the, the, the topic in 101 this week was what is worship? I shared a story that a, a fellow vineyard pastor shared recently at a conference. And he said, you know, he said there was a, a woman, actually a couple in their church who um, suffered a, a horrible loss. I believe it was the death of a child. And it was devastating for them. And the wife especially found that it affected the way that she responded to God when she came to church. Because in her head, she believed that God is good in her heart, she was questioning how this could happen. And she was wrestling with that tension, like, God, I believe you're good, and I don't understand why my child was ripped from me, right? Very real, very real thing. And so she, she told Adam later, she said, uh, for the first year after that loss, I came to church and I couldn't bring myself to sing those songs, but I needed to be hearing those songs. And so I came and I just sat and I let you worship for me. She didn't skip worship. 
She came and she sat and she let her brothers and sisters sing the truth of who God was over her life until she could once again sing it with confidence and say, I know who you are. I don't understand, but I trust you. You are good, right? That's the power of us singing songs together. I love the songs the worship team picked for us this morning. I think they were just perfect. Additionally, songs cultivate unity in the midst of our diversity. We may have different backgrounds, different occupations. We may have different experiences, cultures, priorities, concerns. We may have different politics. But when we fix, coming from all directions, when we fix our minds on Jesus, through the songs we sing, we find the unity the very unity that Jesus was praying for at the end of his life, knowing that he was going to the cross, John 17, we have the, the final prayers of Jesus and what the things that he was, he was uh, preoccupied by as he made that last journey to the cross. And one of the things he was praying for was us and how we would live. Listen to this. John 17. Jesus said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, his immediate ones, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. And as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Jesus cares very deeply I'm going to say this, and I don't have a verse that says this explicitly, but I, I think I can say this with quite a bit of confidence. Jesus cares less about how we vote this week than about how we treat fellow brothers and sisters. What's on his heart in this moment? He's praying for unity. He's praying that we would be one. He's not praying that we'll all vote the same. He's not praying that we'll all think the same. It's praying that we'll be one because of who we are in him. I think it's interesting that he says, they may be in us, that final line, so that the world will believe you sent me. Jesus says it is a testimony to the rest of the world when diverse people live in unity with their hearts fixed on Jesus. People go, how do you do that? It, it, it's, one, it's one thing to worship with people who think exactly the same as you do. It's a whole other thing when you worship with people who actually think differently. And you go, that's not, that's not going to bring a difference between us because what, what unites us is not our politics, it's our relationship with Jesus. Okay? Jesus said it would be a testimony, a witness to the world. Second thing, be, be being filled with the Spirit, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Second expression of the ongoing infilling of the Spirit is, in fact, directed towards the Lord. I thought it was notable this week that he says, make melody to the Lord with your heart. He didn't say with your vocal cords or with your mouth or your lips. He said with your heart. That means that what he's talking about is something deeper than just reciting the words mechanically that we're all singing together. He's talking about actually singing from the core of who we are and, 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 and letting those things be a prayer. The whole passage is about careful and deliberate living here. And here in this context, it's expressed in the songs we sing to God with each other from a heart that's fully engaged. So sometimes that means that the, the songs we sing can become prayers for what we most want to be true. I love that the worship team selected that song for us this morning, Jesus Be the Center. And as I sang that, I, I, it's, a, it's a chance for me to recenter on God. Because I drift. I drift from the center. I read the news. I get pulled this way and that way. And I get all hijacked and whiplashed. <laughs> And then I come back and my brothers and sisters lead me in a song where I sing, Jesus, be the center. And it's a prayer for my heart because I, that's what I most want to be true. I know it needs to be true. It's truer today than it was a year ago, but it's not as true as I hope it is a year from now. And so that's a prayer of formation. Jesus, would you be the center? Be the center in me, be the center in us. Take your rightful place. Would you be at home in us? 
people and dwell with the Holy Spirit? And would you be enthroned in us that all of our lives are lived in worship to you? The third part, third expression of the ongoing and filling of the Spirit. He says, be filled with the Spirit, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what always and everything means, right? I thought about it this week. I think it's a little bit like when we, if you've been, if you've been married, you may probably made vows and you said something like, uh, for better or for worse. The reality is when we make vows, they're not really for the better because we don't really need a vow to hold us in the marriage when everything's great. <laughs> the vows are for when it's worse. That's when we need a vow to say, I made a covenant with you and with God, right? In the same way, when Paul says, giving thanks to God always and in everything, it's not, he's not really having to say that for the times when everything's going great. He has to say that for the times when it's not going the way we wanted it to go or thought it should go or are praying it will go. It's for those times. He says, in those times, part of your walk is to consider, how do, what, what can I be thankful for in this? Sometimes it's just saying, God, I thank you that this circumstance that we're navigating is, is devastating and I know it won't always be like this. I know you are making all things new and one day, one day it won't be like this. And so I trust you with my today, right? That's one of the ways we can give thanks to God in all, all ways and in everything. Every opportunity then becomes a circumstance in which we can look for the goodness and the promises of God. I love that. Again, I, I'm harping on our worship team this morning, but in a good way. This morning they sang that song that started with goodness of God, right? We have to be told over and over that God is good so that when our circumstances make us question if God is good, we can hold on to that and say, okay, God, I believe that you're good. You've, you've been good throughout human history. You've never let us down. I'm going to choose to trust you today. I'm going to choose to worship you and thank you. It's only truly possible to thank God always and for everything if we believe that he's altogether good if we believe that he's sovereign over all creation and that he will finish the redemption of creation that he began in Jesus. It's about cultivating a posture of trust in God the Father's goodness, even when our expected outcome or the things we prayed for are not happening. One last expression of being filled with the Spirit. Oops. Be filled with the Spirit, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I, one of the reasons I really like ESV is it keeps this verse in this paragraph. Other translations will often separate this and put it in the instructions to the household codes, they call it, after this. But in the Greek, this is all one run-on sentence. This is an expression of being filled with the Spirit. To live lives of submitting to one another specifically talking about believers, he's writing to the church, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does that mean? He's zeroing in specifically on how we live with one another. And he says, submit. I think it probably starts with the same preferring of one another that Brent talked about in Philippians 2. Have this mindset with one another that Jesus had of not grasping for power not having to be right, but actually submitting and laying down your, your rights for the sake of another person. I think the, the current, the moment we live in gives us all kinds of opportunities to choose to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That doesn't mean agreeing that everybody's right, but it means laying down our own need to be right, to be affirmed, to be understood, right? Right now, the, the, the moment we live in affords us the opportunity to submit to one another out of worship for Jesus. The Jesus who at the end of his earthly life before the crucifixion was praying that we be one and says, if you want to worship me, don't just sing songs. Prefer one another even when you don't agree. Submit to one another. 
out of reverence for Christ. It means trusting the spirit of God in fellow believers and having the humility to believe the best instead of assuming the worst. I think I need to read that one more time. It means trusting the spirit of God in fellow believers and having the humility to believe the best instead of assuming the worst when we differ. It means getting curious about how two people filled with the same spirit are not seeing the same thing eye to eye. And rather than judging and dividing, we can get curious about that and say, can you help me see what you're seeing? Help me see what I'm not seeing. That's, that's the humility of Jesus in Philippians 2 that we can prefer one another. In all things, it's asking how should I relate to others in a way that worships Jesus? I want to close with a story and put a picture up here. Does anybody recognize that band? It's not a great picture. Does anybody recognize it? No? The hint is they have, they have trumpets. It's ska, yeah? It's Five Iron Frenzy. Some of you may know Five Iron Frenzy. They're a really popular Christian band in the late 90s, early aughts. Around the time I was a youth pastor. Um, super popular, uh, great Christian band. The lead singer was a guy named Reese Roper. Did songs like Blue Comb 78. Uh, classic. 2002, they were traveling from, uh, I believe it was from Seattle to, uh, to Salt Lake City. And, uh, and they, that's a pretty long drive, as you think about it. They decided to overnight in Boise. They didn't have a concert tour or a concert stop planned in Boise, but they thought, well, we're going to be staying overnight there. What if we did a spontaneous concert? And so they reached out to a friend of mine. His name rhymes with Jeremy Graves. And uh, we were both, we were fellow youth pastors here in town. Uh, and Jeremy was in the music industry as well as being a youth pastor. And so they reached out through their promoter or whatever and said, hey, could you arrange a venue like in short notice that we could do a concert? So Jeremy reached out and said, hey, would, would you want to open up Vineyard's Gym to do a Five Iron Frenzy concert? Now back then, uh, the sanctuary was about half the size it is now. And there was no Heritage Hall, no Heritage Plaza. There, the gym was a standalone building. And I was like, that, I'm like, Jeremy, that's in like two days. And he goes, yeah. And I was like, well, is it worth it? Well, can we even get the word out? And he's like, they'll promote it. They're going to put it on. They're going to blitz Christian radio. They're going to reach out to all the youth pastors and, and uh, they'll, they'll promote it. We just have to open the doors. So we agree. We open the doors. I, we have no idea if, if kids are going to show up. It's five bucks, right? Literally, it was five bucks to go. This is like 2001. There's a line of kids from the doors of the gym, right, where, where, the, where you enter into the children's ministry, you go up the steps, all the way out to the furthest entrance of the parking lot. And it's about six to seven kids deep all the way back. And I'm like, wow. They come in, they do a concert, they set up, they do a concert, and it was one of the loudest and highest energy concerts I've been to. Partly the acoustics of the gym, but it was so loud that there was, there was like this snow falling, the whole, the whole concert, and it was the insulation from the ceiling <laughs> being vibrated loose. And it was so high energy that the kids were just, they were just so wound up. It was like they couldn't contain the energy. And, and there was, there literally, there was a track inside of the gym, around the perimeter of the gym, of kids just running in circles, like while the band played. And I just, I wasn't, I was, I, like, I was familiar with Five Iron, but I wasn't a fan. So I just stood there as a spectator and just watched. I'm like, wow, this is, this is fascinating. The end of the concert, the, the worship team, they, or the, the, the band, they do their last song. They, uh, they, they, I think they left the stage and the kids start clapping, you know, cheering, stomping, waiting for an encore. And the band comes back and the kids are so excited, like they're going to do more music. They're going to give us another en encore. And they come back on stage and they don't pick up their instruments. Instead, they, they sit down on the edge of the stage without their instruments. And Reese begins singing Amazing Grace. And the entire room just stops. Get... 
And across the room, and I'm standing in the back just watching this, he just went like this. The whole place packed with kids, mostly all teens. All these kids are suddenly had their hands raised and acapella are worshiping God together, singing Amazing Grace. A song that cultivates humility. A song that celebrates God. And all these kids, they're from different youth groups, different schools, different cliques at their schools, different denominations. Suddenly they're unified in worshiping Jesus. And, and, and suddenly it's not insulation falling anymore. It's the Holy Spirit. And I'm not kidding. I have never, even with all the Vineyard Worships conferences I've gone to and, and worship sets I've been a part of, I've never felt the Holy Spirit fall so heavily as it did that night. And I just stood there in the back weeping and with chills. Like, what is happening If I get the worship team, guess how we're going to end our time together this morning? (laughs) Um, As they come, you can keep your seats for just a moment, but I will invite you to stand if you're able when, when we sing. But on Tuesday night, we have a night of worship. Oftentimes we do nights of worship and... I would say it's the usual suspects who show up, right? It's not everybody, and sometimes that's schedule-based, but it's, there's, it's a subset of the church that shows up when we do a night of worship. We have a night of worship this Tuesday that I really hope everybody that's able to come comes to. Because uh, here's the thing, it's election day, and if you haven't already voted, I would encourage you Go vote. Go do your civic duty. Do it in prayer. Do it with thoughtfulness. But having done that, I want you to come here and together we need to remind one another of who we are in Christ and to put our devotion on him. Brent was kind of joking, I think, when he said, leave your phones at the door. I would say, when you come, put your phones on airplane mode. Just turn them off for an hour and a half. It's a discipline. You can do it. I can do it, (laughs) right? But why? Because we need to resist the narrative that's in our culture that says everything hinges on this. I don't know what's going to happen over the next few weeks, but our hope is not in who's in the White House. It's who's on the throne in heaven, okay? That's our hope. And I... I know I need to resist the temptation to be overly uh, happy with the results or overly devastated. And the reality is, it doesn't matter. It matters, it doesn't matter. Let me say a couple things about this. I think what we do if we gather, if we go vote and do our civic duty and then we gather as brothers and sisters who, with, with people who probably voted differently than we did, at least on some issue. I doubt if we're all going to have identical ballots. When we do that, it's a prophetic witness. And Jesus said, so that they will know. When you live as one, it tells the world that I'm real because it's a miracle, right? It's a prophetic witness to our culture that our identity and our hope are secure in what God has already begun, what he's promised to bring to completion. It's a witness that our trust and our adoration belong to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not to a candidate or a party or an outcome. We get to come together and sing songs that remind our our own hearts that God is and always has been altogether good. And we know that he is restoring and reconciling his once good creation. We use that word that Tyson used at the beginning here. For us, it's a defiant choice to set aside the division that's happening in almost every sphere of our culture and choose to worship alongside people who may think differently, vote differently. By refusing to vilify the brother or sister in Christ who sees things differently, we submit to one another out of reverence, out of worship for Christ. (laughs) 
quote a fellow pastor. Presidents change, but the mission of the church does not change. We're called to keep showing and sharing the love of God in a hurting world, inviting others into the goodness of life with Jesus as people who are be being filled with the Holy Spirit. So that night's not a night you are welcome to pray for what you believe to be the, the, the best outcome. I encourage you to do so. But it's, this isn't a prayer gathering to, to pray for a desired outcome. It's a, it's a gathering to worship Jesus, to lift him up. I'll go back and I just want to look at those four things once again and think about Tuesday night in light of what Paul just said to us. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Would you stand and let's worship.